Okay. Hello, and welcome to Bite and Sugary Tea Party number 2.5, with guest author Leonid Blian, who will be talking about his book chapter entitled The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Light Touch. My name is Graham Scar from Nottingham, UK. And I'm Susan Lowell de Salorsino, coming to you from the United States Colony of Washington, D.C. And I'm Chris Morita Clancy, coming to you today from Deep Cove, the unceded territory of the Coast Salish Nation, quite near Vancouver, B.C. It's our intention to, impro to promote and share the biotensegrity concept with as many people as possible and to include you all in that mission. The Biotensegra Tea Party is an all volunteer production of the Stephen M. Levin Biotensegrity Archive, a nonprofit organization whose mission is to educate, raise public awareness and build community in the field of biotensegrity and to foster and forward discovery research and understanding in the fields of science and medicine. All right, thanks guys. So let's now introduce our team. Mariana Barreto from Mississauga, Ontario. Hi Mariana. Hello everyone, hi, happy to be here. Rachel Tudor from Turnwater, Washington. Hi everybody, Hi, good to see you all. And Lisa Babiot from St. Albert, Alberta. Hi Lisa. Hi, and Gregory Chudy from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Hey, everybody. Hi, Gregory. Hey, Gregory. So let's begin things by opening with a toast from Leonid Blium. Well, you know, you you see, today I have the appropriate cup with some kind of microphone here. So that's kind of for the spread of knowledge and uh, motivation and thank you all for being here and uh, i hope i will try not to disappoint your friday evening so cheers cheers yeah. thanks leonid so before we begin let's hear more about our sponsors from uh, chris i think yes it's for me today thanks graham and thanks leonid our Biotensegrity Tea Party is an all-volunteer production of the Stephen M. Levin Biotensegrity Archive, made possible through the generous support of our sponsors. Handspring Publishing has been with us since the beginning. They have a wide range of authors, many of whom are here at the tea parties, and books available for movement manual therapy professionals. And also they produce a regular newsletter and an ongoing webinar series with Elizabeth Larkham. Elizabeth is here too. I see you. Hi, Elizabeth. Elizabeth's here and Neil's here and he's going to be on next week. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. And then Embody Biotensegrity, which is my learning platform. And we provide resources for learning. Right now we're offering a two-week trial for the membership. You can find the link in the chat. Also, the coupon code for Handspring Publishing will be in the chat. Artifact Pro in Madrid, Spain. They produce wonderful tensegrity models, which you can see on some of our past model zoo biotensegrity tea parties. We have also as a sponsor Integrated Biotensegrity out of Alberta, Canada. Lisa and Rachel are spearheading that project along with uh, Paul Thornley. They had a, apparently an amazing weekend last weekend. You have until Sunday to purchase the recordings for that and they will be available for a month. Finally, up and coming, the Biotensegrity Congress. They're running a series of workshops for movement and manual therapists on April 23rd to 25th. Some of us here will be presenting and they have a 15% off coupon, which again, Gregory, thank you, we'll put in the chat. And that is active that is only for a short while. Go ahead, Susan. Yeah, it's so right now the Congress is at a lower price. The price is going to go up after the 10th and okay. This discount for 15% off of that lower price is good until that, until the 10th. So everything changes then. So um, get it while you can. So register what the 10th is coming up soon. It's next Wednesday. So Wednesday, register. Yeah. And we'll see you there. 
that is it for now, Graham. I pass the mic back to you. Right. Thanks, Chris. Well, uh, let's introduce our speaker, Leonid Leon, who is an international leader in cerebral palsy re rehabilitation, the founder of Advanced Biomechanical Rehabilitation, ABR, and a mathematician, and one of the trustees of the Stephen M. Levin Biotensegrity Archive. And he joins us today for a presentation and discussion on the unreasonable effectiveness of light touch, which also happens to be the name of his chapter in the book, Scars, Adhesions and the Biotensegral Body, edited by Jan Arthur and Sharon Wheeler, and published by Handspring Publishing. And here is a copy of the book, and oh, Chris as well. There Have a look go. at it. So thanks, Leonid. I transfer it over to you. Can I can I jump in and say at this point it's probably good for everyone to turn their cameras off uh, so YouTube gets a better picture. Is that right, Chris? That's right. Yeah. yeah. Yes, That's please great. let's do that. Although I notice I had it on active speaker, so I will turn it to gallery view now. Okay, okay then. so I guess right away I can probably start with the screen sharing thing and unreasonable effectiveness of light touch. Okay, so, you know, truth to be told, I have just at the last moment decided to kind of slightly shift the whole context of the presentation because you see, this is a chapter. This is a chapter in the book, but I believe that behind it is a much larger motivation. So, and, uh, you know, like whilst first I wanted to just kind of dive into the thing and uh, get really into this practical thing. So like maybe a couple of hours actually said, you know, like let's maybe use this opportunity to ask the bigger questions and um, let's kind of bring their bigger motivations behind. It. And let me try to explain it a bit further. So motivation. What I really want to say is that when we are in the bodywork field, it's a very practical field, right? The very practical field of the direct interaction with people, direct sort of observation of the effects and action and so on. But because of this, we often kind of miss the bigger picture behind it. Like what is the sort of true role of the entire, say, bodywork field? And if we put it this way, the pragmatic, applicable anatomy, kinesiology, movement science, and so on, to the kind of global picture of the human knowledge, quest for knowledge, sciences, and so on. So that's where I want to start. You see, really, in the really big picture, what we should see is that, in fact, anatomy itself is the foundation of the human cognification of the world. You know, we tend to think that it's science, right? So that we tend to think that the, that the sort of the fathers of our modern uh, world are people like Galileo, people like Newton and so on. And if we really look at the timing, I would kind of put the claim and say that the real person who started the scientific revolution was Master Vesalius. So because his work came in the 14, what, 14, 14 in the, sorry, in the 1543, so it was pre-Galileo. And the amazing thing is that until today, if you think about it, 1543, until today, there are 700 manuscripts which are still available among the libraries around the world. It was a nine volume piece, and you can only imagine the way how that kind of changed the world. Because basically, Vizali was, was, the, was the first person who kind of took it from, from the age old, from the original works of Galen, right? So who believed that the anatomy of the human was identical, more or less, to the anatomy of the apes or the monkeys that he studied. And Vizali was the first one to actually bring the experimental method in that sense. But what I would claim further it's this picture of the standing skeleton, like naked skeleton, the skeleton without anything, that actually established this sort of 
unconscious, subconscious, whatever view of the world. And even the people who came later, Galileo, Newton, and so on, these people would still have this image. And in that sense, I would say that the way how we perceive the world, how we interpret the world in general, not just this anatomy, but everything up to nuclear physics actually starts here. So, and I believe that this is really important to understand, to realize what would be the general claim, the big role of the biotensegrity in that sense, right? So my personal motivation for biotensegrity, because I've always seen it in the way of being foundational. So like, but foundational reinterpretation of the human body. But when it comes to the reinterpretation of the human body, the big thing about it is, is being dynamic. And what is the most practical way, the pragmatic way, how we experience the dynamics? That's direct contact. So that's why for me, body work is not just a small kind of under scientified or under like cognified part of the human, you know, general economy, life, science, and so on. For me, the way that I look at it, it's actually that sort of centerpiece. Because if we really understand that the whole foundations of the modern science has to be tracked back, the first revolution, pre-Copernicus, pre-Galileo, you know, pre-Kepler, pre-Newton, and so on, it's actually been Vesalius. And that is really very much printed in our head. So that's why, you know, that is one of the bigger motivations to see the whole role, like where we are, who we are, and what is in that sense also what kind of responsibility we have on our shoulders. And if we look at this big picture and ask ourselves the next question, so what would be the motivation, not just for this chapter, but for the whole like perspective, we have to admit the fact that body workers are very special people. And the fact is that actually why, as a person who's been trained in cybernetics, why am I in this field and what sort of motivates me, right? So first of all, I just generally admire body workers. I admire this whole, you know, the entire field from movement people to body workers of all sorts and colors and clusters because you know, it's a very special direct exploration, very special direct experience of the world and general of the people. But if we go further, what we have to see? Today, our role, our position is that tiny. And in that sense, my personal motivation is to help as much as I can humanly, right? To get the thing forward, to get the sort of to make some steps towards the fact that we have to get the recognition that the entire field and industry deserves and the place among sciences. The other thing that really bothers me, that really kind of fuels and drives me is the thing is that body workers deliver a huge body, a huge pool, a huge reservoir of the experiential findings like these interactions that each of you have with human bodies, it's absolutely huge. But what happens today? These experiential findings, they don't go anywhere. There are no right formats to put it in. Even, you know, like the journals that exist, they chop and cut and so on. They try to squeeze it into the format of the other science. So, which are by definition experimental, whilst body work is experiential. So the way that I see it is that what we have to aspire to is how to find the way to integrate this into the bigger picture. So next thing that really bothers me as well is that body work today is absolutely fragmented. There are like dozens, hundreds of schools and so on and so on. And people all tend to sort of discuss 
the minutia of how this school is different from that school and what who does what and so on and so on. There are lots of egos and so on involved. But my basic invitation is that guys, you know, like if we take a three, whatever, 10,000 or maybe even more feet view, we have to be looking for their transition. What kind of scientific base do we need to get the body work from the fragmented state into the united body work? And the next thing that also bothers me, right, is that which kind of flips with the first point that admiring the body workers, I see the extraordinary talent there. I see the extraordinary talent of people able to pee, to play the tunes, right? To play the tunes of their own body, to find the special states inside and outside, to people being able to play the tune of the other people's bodies, right? But this is all playing by ear because the scientific representation of it is so bad that actually there is really no systematic way which would help this extraordinary talent to start playing by notes. It's as if we are like in the verbal culture, you know, like pre, you know, pre alphabets, pre writing, pre whatever. So it's like mytho mythology and the uh, epos, which is gene being passed by uh, means of apprenticeship and so on. And I believe that we need to try to get it into the next stage. And the same thing that I believe that if you look at the experience of the other sciences, what happens, the moment you get from the craftsman phase to the technology, to the kind of scientification and so on. So that actually translates into the huge boost in effectiveness. And in that sense, I do think that we should be looking into the ways how to systematize or systemize or whatever the discovery process. And I believe there is a huge potential there, whatever, 10x or more in bringing the effectiveness of body work. And, you know, maybe a smaller thing there, but this is what I also believe is that is that today, because of this talent, because of playing by ear and so on, we have a very special sort of type of minds, a very special type of personality kind of features, which tends to become the body worker. You know, truth to be told, you know, I kind of came from a different world, right? So you see, I, you know, I came from the abstract mind people, so from equations and so on. And it just been like my historical journey, how can I get into there? But I believe that if the moment we need to build the new foundation, so the new minds, would come into this field, would get enriched. And so that would be kind of a cross exchange and so on. And that would be really the opportunity to get more between different fields and get the transitions. So that's my bigger motivation behind this small chapter. And probably the few words that I want to say about myself, right? So you see, you know, I'm not mathematician per se, right? I've been trained as a cybernetician, right? So cybernetics is actually the ultimate meta science. So it's the science which sort of looks at other sciences, right? Technologies, industries, and so on. And computer science is just being a subset of it, right? And what you're trying to do you know, what's the whole method of cybernetics? You look at whatever field you look at, and every field is a kind of bundle. It's a bundle between their cognification, like the software, and the particular field, the particular scale, the particular, you know, like say size, the particular, you know, uh, objects, subjects, and so on. So, like physics has a cognification engine and has their different scales of matter, right? So, biology, body work, whatever. And what happens is that different fields, due to historical reasons, they have different qualities of cognifications. So that's my main point. So what cybernetics item ultimately is trying to do is to look at a certain field and say, hey, for example, this is body work. Let's see what these guys are doing, right? So you see what is happening in that field, what is there, and then try to find out what kind of cognification engine there, how do they interpret the things that they're doing, and then let's see. So how we can, for example, compare it with other fields. I mean, 
take nuclear science, right? And you take nuclear physics and say, hey, in nuclear physics, they work with matter at that little scale. Of course, it has nothing to do with body work by the scale, but they cognify this way and we cognify that way. So if their cognification is better, what we shall do, we, sh we shouldn't be trying to take the nuclear physics into there, right? But we should take the cognification, how they interpret things, and then try to do the arbitrage, right? So you see how to move it from that field into our field. And then we, that's the way to progress. So, and that's, for example, also relates to the quantum physics and so on, because people when say, oh, you know, like it's all quantum. No, it's not all quantum because quantum is, you know, the quantum constant is 10 minus 33. But what you can do there, you can extract the cognification engine and say, hey, quantum science tells us that because of the principle of the, you know, of the uh, indetermination, right? So you see then what you have there, the uncertainty principle. So that tells us that the least that you can do for the representation of nature is their matrix. You cannot bring it down to a point. And that's already a cognification that we can transport and get into, other, uh, into our field. So that's kind of the way that I think that's the kind of the way I'd approach. And I'm just trying to share this maybe bigger picture and hopefully plant some seeds of reasoning for you before we move into the details. But you see, when cyber, in cybernetics, of course, cybernetic is heavily met mathematized, right? So you see by definition, so these cognifications engines, they have to be mathematized and brought into the same format, you know, the data format and so on in order to be transportable between different fields. Otherwise, you know, if they're just words, it makes for endless discussions. But cyberneticians are the ultimate generalists. So it's a general meta science. So in that sense, you have to specialize. And most of the people in this profession, they move into I know, finance, they move into computer science and so on. It just happened because of my family history that I chose to specialize in their movement science, you know, both theoretical and pragmatic. So that's kind of just how it happened 30 years ago, you know, because of my father and all the whole history and so on. But that actually, because of the very, very, very special timing of what was happening in Russia back then, so that kind of defined my choice and defined my whole relationship with their body work. And I guess it makes sense just to spend a few words on this so that to help you to understand. Because you see, what happens is that you, because of the historical circumstances, the way that you come into body work usually comes through a certain particular school. So you decide to become a body worker, say you go to, you know, osteopathy school, or you start somewhere else and you switch to, I don't know, or chiropractic or yoga or whatever, or structural integration. So these things, you start with a particular school, you learn the beginnings, all the, you know, like the knowledge and so on already within that school. So in that sense, later on, you might try to expand, but you already, to begin with, you are a specialist who tries to get into a generalist. The way that the whole thing happened for me was a really like very, very like special opening there. Because you see in Russia, you know, Soviet Union back then for ideology reasons, everything manual was kind of semi-prohibited. And it was only in 1988 that there was a kind of seminal Congress there that sort of allowed the manual therapy in general. So what happened at the same time, two years later, the Soviet Union collapsed. So suddenly all fields of body work at once, all the foreign ones, which performed and with different traditions, different, you know, legal status, different, you know, characters, personalities, you know, different languages and so on. They, all of them, they just flooded the Russian thing at once. And for the person who was like, what, 18 years of age at the moment, you just kind of come in and it's suddenly like everything at once. You don't make a distinction. Oh, you know, like this is, you no, know, it's the same, whether it's body work, you know, whether it's osteopathy, whether it's physical therapy, whether it's, you know, whether it's chiropractic. So you just basically look at this, you know, as a generalist, as a cybernetician say, you know, what, what are these people doing? This is pragmatic anatomy, right? So that's the whole field 
if you look at it from this perspective of the first principles, that's what they do. These people apply mechanical impact onto the bodies and explore the responses which are happening along the way. And that was it, you know, like I never really had any bias, right? So you see, I was always kind of coming as an outsider, as a cybernetician who was, okay, I'm going to explore this field. Why did I do this? Because my father was a famous, or, you know, like Russian manual therapist. And in that sense, what also happened at that point, because in 1988, the whole kind of restrictions were lifted. There were also tons of kind of underground Russian practitioners who just suddenly just sprang to life. I always compare it to the scene from uh, the Lion King, you know, when Timon and Pumbaa, uh, you know, the Akuna Matata song. So when they are just kind of lifting their, uh, you know, the, the log in the forest and lift it up, and suddenly like there are all sorts of insects, you know, just kind of um, starting to run around, right? So that's how it was in Russia, like in the very beginning of 90s. And I was fortunate to see this whole thing. And at the same time, right, so you see my father got a department, so to teach manual therapy to postgraduate doctors who wanted to re-specialize, but there was nothing in, in Russian. So I had to literally like translate basically textbooks from, you know, like do the lectures for those doctors, you know, and I would take textbooks on whatever was available, you know, chiropractic, osteopathy, physical therapy, and so on. I have to compile something, you know, to just give it to them. So for me, it always has been, the unified, the united body work. And then my choice of going into cerebral palsy was motivated by the same thing. You know, like, as I told myself, you know, like as a cyberintician, so you are looking for the specific subject which has the most, the greatest seeds of generalism. So that's where I went. Because in the cerebral palsy, you see, for example, take a simple example. So, you know, you are facing some, looking at troubles with the back. You know, and say, okay, I will devote my life to figuring out the things about the low back pain. But as a systems person, saying, well, if I figured out something about the low back pain, now if you try to connect, I know the hip problems and the lumbar problems. So whatever you figured out for the lumbar gets invalidated. So you have to refigure it for the system. If you have been able to figure out something about the hip dislocation and then try to add the scoliosis into the mix, Whatever you found about the hip dislocation, you have to throw out, and now you have to do the whole mix. Whatever you found about the scoliosis, you have to do the whole mix. So that's how I came to the cerebral palsy. It was a very simple thing, you know, because that's where you have all the problems, all of them thought possible problems that could happen to the, to the, to the human bodies, all of them in one package, including the neurology, including the underdevelopment and so on. So that's my general perspective of the world. And then in that sense, once you look at that, then it's not difficult to see what's happening in the body work today. We have to admit the fact that, you know, the way we are as the body work field, it's a public relation and scientific disaster. You know, we don't get, in that sense, there are amazing people with terrible, and that has to be clear, self-presentation. You know, the language that we have in the field, who would listen to us? You know, like, you know, there's, in that sense, we're being, if you look at the way how the doctors, scientists, and so on, you know, respond to our language, they laugh. Why? Because we describe the experiences trying to use the language from experimental science. And then we fail. So that's, we are, people who are working at the millimeters and we try to take the science which is designed, you know, let's say for tons and kilos and so on. You know, we are working at the uniform deformation range and we try to take the science which is designed for high impact, you know, let's say collisions and so on. Of course, we end up with terrible self-presentation. And then, you know, the same thing. We've got great results. You know, if you listen to any practitioner with good background and kind of who's being experimentally robust, they're great results. They, all of them, they have some great results behind their back, but they're horrible explanations there, you know, trying to explain what they did. Oh, you know, I did a fascia release. Gee, guys, you know, like put the things in, 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 in comparison, the magnitude of your impact and the magnitude of the response. So, you know, things have to kind of get together. 
So, and my point is that in general, we have to see that the way that if we look at this, you know, incidents of magic, incidents of miracles that are a routine happening for the body workers, to, you know, let's say in their practice, we are just actualizing out of this huge potential with actualizing just a tiny, tiny speckle of this. So I want you to see this bigger picture, you know, like so just from, you know, oh, okay, what other technique am I going to learn or whatever, whatever, right? So you see, I want you to see the bigger picture that, you know, like we have the, as a field, as an industry, as, as, a, as a branch of cognification and so on, we have a huge potential, but we need better language, better, you know, better cognification to make it happen. And that's why we are isolated, we're not respected and so on and so forth. And, you know, look, I experienced this firsthand because, you know, my friends and people who I know, they're all, you know, either physicists or, you know, like just basically the people from engineers, the people from hard scientific thinking. And when I would try to explain in their terms of their, which are being offered in the bodywork textbooks, they would just laugh at me. You know, like, I mean, like I would be embarrassed to talk about. So, and that would be the highest, that would be like this really tension and discomfort. And like, look, this is, I observe with my own eyes that there's some amazing things happening, but the language is so poor. The representation of the bodies, the representation of what we do is so poor that basically by when we try to articulate it, it's covered as a, you know, like laughable. So, and that's really the bigger thing. And in that sense, you know, for me, the bite and integrity is the approach is that this kind of entry, which gives us a big potential in that, but we have to play it right. We have to expand it and put it into the right context. So that's basically what I'm saying. And then, you know, and for me, frankly, even the things, you know, like for example, things that happen with the whole fascia congresses and so on, I mean, I have tons of respect for the entire for the entire group and the entire clan, but we have to realize it's a catch up attempt. You know, like it's basically look at it's us looking from below at the experimental laboratory sciences and kind of being patronized. You know, like I mean, that could be very well felt. For example, and you take Berlin and so on, the last one. So what happens? You see, you are being there is a it was a very distinct sense there. Scientists who are kind of preaching from the M1, right? And there is a and there is a kind of listeners, practitioners who make it happen, who pay for the whole thing, and they say, oh, you know, like what I what's happening there in the laboratory? Well, 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 now I'm going to grab this idea, you know, like fascia response to this and the mouse, you know. And then what happens? The scientist tells you, no, 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 no. I've told you from this, you know, from the big high tribune, but you have to be scientific. You are not allowed to take what you heard here and drag it into your practice and say that, you know, that, that, the, that the science has proven this about fascia, you know, like whatever, the contractility of the lumbar thoracic fascia in a rat after in, in, in the laboratory conditions. So we have to understand this. So that's a trouble in which we are. And this is a bigger picture. This is a bigger picture which Bayat and Segrity is trying to solve. And when we are writing something and communicating it, this is what we're trying to do. And my main point is that it all starts with having an honest self-reflection. We have to understand, look, we are an amazing field with amazing people with amazing potential. But what we do, when we try to explain it, it's laughable. And it's an intellectual escape. The moment you escape into esoterics, the moment in you escape, you know, it might exist and so on, but it's, it's a different language. You can't kind of play it there. So, and in that sense, it's also important, you know, when you are explaining things, you have to know the tricks. You have to know how science works. You have to, you know, it's like, because there are always this detection. You know, because you see, for example, if you say, you know, force, and you don't know that the force is a second order derivative, you know, let's say of the displacement, and this word doesn't mean anything to you. You say, oh, force, you know, like force could be large or force could be small. You know, no one is going to take you seriously. 
you know, you cannot then translate your experiences into other fields. You have to know the math behind it and you have to know the cognification engines which are working there. So, and in that sense, that's what I actually started this. That was the main motivation for me to bring this chapter when, you know, when Jen asked me about writing. So, you know, and if you don't know the, un the, the unreasonable effectiveness, it's a quote from the famous article of Eugene Wigner, the Nobel Prize winner in, uh, in nuclear physics. And it's called the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. And that's what my chapter starts from, right? So unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. So where he talks about the fact that we humans, we've been blessed with mathematics. We don't know how it works, but it's sort of, it's been working amazingly well for us. And we have to try to cognify it and get more of the reflection in order to get more of that, right? And that's exactly the thing where we are. When we talk about the light touch in particular, so this is the thing. We have to accept the fact, and first of all, being intellectually honest, right? So you see, when your super light touch translates into the whole body, myofascial unwinding, or the major transformations, you shouldn't just take, oh, you know, like, you know, I just did the fascia release, you know, like, okay. And I did the fascia release and, you know, like it's been, you know, the spirit, the soul, you know, the energy and so on and so on. No, that doesn't, you know, you can't do this. You can't bring some kind of crap, you know, from the, well, the release crap, because then the forces don't match. So that was my whole first point. You see, we have to be intellectually honest. And, you know, when you put your hand and it's a light touch and so on, and you experience, experience this sense of ease, the release, the whatever, right? So you see that suddenly tissues are melting and transforming and then spreading and kind of going through the phases of transformations and so on. And I say, you know what? You know, I just did the fascia release. Say, hey, you know, if I am, coming from the other side of the fence and saying, hey guys, hi, you know, do you have the experimental measurements? What are the pound force relationships for the collagen bundle? Hey, hundreds of pounds per square inch. Hmm, how interesting. And how much force did you apply? Yeah, 100 times less. And you are telling me that what you did is a release, you know, if the person is polite, this person's, if the person is going to leave and say, you know, let's have a drink. If the person is not polite, what they're going to say, you are a fraud. You are just a lucky anecdotal, you know, let's say beneficiary. So you get something which you have no explanation for. So you have no right to be in the temple of science, in the temple of reasonable people. So, and that's the real dilemma that we are facing, that we are facing this thing that what we, you see, and that's kind of the whole emotional thing. Hey, 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 look, look, you know, like I'm putting the hand there and, you know, the sky is transforming under my hand and so on and so on. But then if you try to explain it, psh, puff. So that's why the whole thing that it was this book on scars that actually brought the whole thing. Right. And then you see, look, you know, this is I'm just using the illustration for my own chapter. So this is coming from the work, light touch work done by their parents, you know, but, you know, who we train for what, like 10, 20, 15 hours overall, 10 hours per year. Right. Who are not skilled or whatever. But look, this is a scar. This is a scar which has been there for many years, which has got organized and so on and so on. And, you know, within a year or something, you know, like within maybe 20, 30 hours of work at this scar, you see the big transformation. You know, look, I am having the picture before I'm having the look after. I did those pictures. I explored those scars and say, hey, this thing changes. Did I apply the force which was, you know, 
comparable to hundreds of pounds? No. But if I say, you know, I didn't apply this force in a conventional way, you know, that's just accident. But what do we see? And then that sense, you know, that's why Jen's book, which starts with scars, it's so important because the scars are the ultimate thing. You see, when we talk about the releases and so on, in say cases of you know fascia densification, right? So you see some blowback pains and so on, there is a lot of room to use the escape explanations. And you know, okay, we applied it there, and then you know the central nervous system adapted, and this was that, and you're like, and then it's a pain signal, and the signal has been modified, and blah blah blah. So basically, you are not facing this hard dilemma, you know, like yes or no, it's a lot of escape. For everybody but when it's a scar there is no escape the scar is either changing or not and in that sense if the scar is changing well you have to face it for what it is it's a fucking miracle it's a fucking miracle you have to admit it so if you what you do is not matching what happens if you're applying like just a fraction of force and you've got the transformations of the established collagen bundles. And those of you who did these dissections, right? So we get back to this point that when you do the dissection in that respect, it has the, it makes the, it, the, the, the scalper gets dull, the scalper. So, and that's a kind of scar like this. So it doesn't make sense. But the thing is that we have to accept and say, hey, this is a true miracle in terms of it happens, but at the same time, it has to be properly cognified. So we can't escape and say, you know, okay, nothing special happened. You know, just like, you know, like I did this, you know, I did the light touch and blah, you know, let's say it released. So it's either or. So that's why the scars are so important. So this is my first point of the whole chapter, the whole mood of it, that we have to be intellectually honest. We have to face this dilemma. This is where we are. And then, you know, like if we see the facts, but the standard explanation is not there, we can't just kind of bring it under the rug. We have to face it and say, well, whatever, how many years and efforts is going to tell us? This is the key question for us to clarify. So, and then, well, then we have to be systematic. And what is happening there? So, because you see, what is the, what is the thing that you usually what, what you usually hear? Prove it. And when it has to kind of you know like because that's the standard tenet of science, the burden of proof is on the shoulders of the newcomer. If you are carrying something, you know, like say so you have to prove it. But what are they offering you as their framework, as a cognification framework for proof? They're giving you the experimental thing where you have to fit frequency wise into the normal distribution. So you have to deliver this kind of results in all the, if not, not 10 out of 10, not 100 out of 100, say, you know, okay, if you do well, 60 out of 100, we will believe you. Will you have this magnitude of transformation that far, that often? Probably not. Does it mean that you're fooling yourself? Does it mean that you are accidental? No. And that's exactly where comes this tricky thing. The tricky thing, plausible versus implausible, proof versus disproof. So these are the inversion relationship. So my point in presenting this is not to prove, not to prove it, but to bring the disproof of impos impossibility. That's the key thing. So you see, think about it. You know, suppose that's the example that I use, but I don't think it went, went in, right? So you see, suppose I come to you and say, hey, you know what? I am capable of levitation. You know, I know how to levitate. You see, Mr. Bloom, this is bullshit. Prove it. Well, I try once, I try three times, I try 10 times, I try 100 times. You say, hey, 100 times, you fail. You are a loser and a fraud. But when it comes to levitation, you see, even if I were able to show it once, 
once once in a, then it would be enough if in a million attempts i would be able to show it once that in itself would already disprove the impossibility see that's the key thing of course we're not there so my point is this if we look at that and there is a scar what would be the standard the standard interpretation you cannot reverse the scarring with the light touch because it's there hundreds of pounds of force per square inch that you need to know that you extend it impossible so that's the standard claim that's what consistently comes out of physics so now if we want to be heard it doesn't mean that we have to show the scars the miracles 60 times out of 100 no if you are able to show a miracle at a reasonable rate right so it depends on the size of the miracle right if you are able to show the miracle say 10 out of 100 even 5 out of 100 that's already sufficient disproof of the impossibility so you have to be taken seriously so that's really the key trick right so you see if you're looking at it from prove it we know the standards it has to be five out you know what say has to be six out of ten to be say seriously taken to get into the first to get into the normal distribution but when it's implausible and considered to be impossible then you're in a different way then you're in a different situation and this is really where we are so my point is that you start with this entry thing and to say hey guys what we see those accumulation of those pictures and for and you know let's say and before afters which are taken in the real experiential sitting settings by jen and 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 sharon and their co-workers and their entire uh scar work that's enough that's enough to prove that to bring the disproof of impossibility so it's a it's a possibility it works so that means that there are some systematic things happening behind it maybe because they're not so well cognified maybe because they're experimental and so on we haven't been able to kind of we are not able to bring it up and it depends on the talent depends on whatever but it's a stream which is strong enough to be taken seriously so that's a starting point from which we have to that we have to go and that means that it's a good illustration why we need a completely different approach to science right we just can't you know that's my point we can't just kind of get this language and say and try to catch up and try to bring the standards of laboratory thing onto us experiential things are different you know they are very different from the experimental because in experiments you're chopping away the context you're chopping away the branching you're chopping away the possibilities and that's what i call this gradient stack right because as a as a as a body worker what you're doing you're bringing yourself in a contact it's a first level right then you waiting for the response it's a second third fourth fifth and so on so you're keeping this tension alive and you sort of and you're stacking the gradients but you know if you start stacking the gradients two four eight right 16 so 10 times the branching that's already a thousand of course how can you possibly fit with this how you can possibly fit into the standard narrow thing which is just one and two so and that's where we move into this next thing so once we understand that we have the disproof of impossibility now we have to ask ourselves a question okay so how what could be the possible mechanism the possible kind of thing and in that scenario what do we do so what our beloved Steve Levin is always talking about get back to the first principles right so you see and you know who is the person who popularized the first principles the most lately that's Mr Musk right so you see Elon Musk with his you know with his starships and so on so because when he tried to buy the rocket 
and get something into shape. So you see the, the, the whole thing was so badly done and so, you know, like expensive. He said, wait, you know, let's say I cannot remodel it and can do it. So I have to go back to first principle and redesign it. The same thing here. We have to go back to the first principle. And what is the first, 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 first principle of us at the pragmatic anatomy, which is body work? Contact response. So if there is a contact response, right? So that means that we are there, stress, that's their y-axis to strain, right? That's the tissue response. And it's a well-known diagram that you're going to find in any, any, absolutely anything on their, on their, what's the name of it, on, on the tendons. So, and what you have there, three phases. So when you talk about the release, when we discuss the mechanotransduction, your words, I do the release. What do you actually claim? I do the response, which is one to a hundred, right? So you see 100 so response in the phase three. But if you are in the phase three, you have to generate hundreds of pounds of force. But if you look at the curve, the curve is actually longer. The curve has phase one and phase two. So my simple point is, guys, you know, your belief in phase three is just coming from badly interpreted physics. In reality, you know, what's happening when you are getting the light touch and that's a cream tissue, you are getting to the phase one and phase two. So my whole point is that to start shifting your attention and language and so on from phase three means the micro injury and the real lengthening move it to the phase one and phase two and the phase two in particular which is the most interesting and this is where we see that this is that you know in technical speak that would be the transitions one two three from zero to one two three percent elongation so that's what where this transformation is happening and that's really my central point so we have to acknowledge that if phase three is impossible with the light touch but the effects are happening which is the reality okay so do we have other explanations here you go that means that it has to happen in phase one and two but at first you say, you know, look, 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 there's nothing happening. There is no elongation. You know, there is just, it's just straight. It's just straight. You know, I don't bring any length. And that's where we move to the next step. So we've got phase of phase one, that's crimp, right? So you see the waviness of the tissues. So you cannot control the tension length relationship. You've got Phase three, that's already the non-linear because you don't know how the irregular thing is going to pull. So the mildest non-linearity, non -linear, non that's the phase one. So that's the most regular, that's the most predictable response. That's what is most likely to feed the mechanical homeostasis. So basically what we are saying, we are moving to the thing, self-healing. But there are two versions of self-healing. Hard self-healing and soft self-healing. Hard self-healing means that you're saying, you know what, I'm bringing the rapture here, right? So you say, I'm bringing the rapture. I am doing this. So then, you know, let's say as I do this micro, micro tears, then the whole thing is going to self-repair and so on. No, but you know, on the other hand, you can say, you know what? Look, if I'm here, I'm going to get the stimulus this way. And that is going to bring their internal self-healing so this is really the central point i mean graham i know that i'm pushing the limits right so it's well, what, what, what i'm going to say is great leonard i wonder if you briefly explain what the little cartoons are for the collagen for anyone who may not be ah okay, okay. so yes little cartoons. so you see basically as i said i'm this is a standard this is a standard you know drawing which comes from mechanobiology of the tendon and you can see it and you can find in all the textbook and so on so 
it was Wang and and uh, and uh, whatever and uh, his uh, co-workers, right? So you see 2006, I believe, right? So you see what's the most systematic review of those. So basically, the whole thing is. So this is stress-strain relationship that describes their relationship between the idle tendon, right? So you see at normal at its regular length and their tear. So and here are the percentages. So this is where you've got the four phases. So the toe phase, when that's the zero, right? The crimp. So this is the wavy situation. So this is where, you know, try to, you know, stretch the whatever, move their wavy, uh, with the wavy tissue, the wavy rubber band, right? So you see the length would change, but the tension would, would not. So it would be unpredictable in that sense. So if you look from the other end, if you pull it, if you extend it more than 8% of the resting length, it's going to, tear apart, that would be tendon rupture. So what happens is that the, 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 the idea of the uh, release comes with the fact that there is a micro tear. So basically, you, you know, because it's short, right? So you see, what is the common linear thinking? If it's short, we have to pull it longer. You know, let's say if I have the rubber band, you know, let's say, okay, that's a resting length. Here I bring it. If I pull it further, I know if I bring it too hard, that would be phase four. I will just tear it apart. But if I do it and kind of, uh, you know, like just tear just a few fibers at the moment and then they would repair and so on. So that's how I would get it longer, longer and longer. But what that's what I'm saying. This is the phase three interpretation of the release, which is bullshit because, you know, like what you're doing, you know, it's a tiny one hundredth of a fraction of the forces that are needed to introduce this micro rapture. So my point is this, when we look here, so you've got the waviness. So that's where the thing, when you straighten from the wave to strengthen from the neutral length to their best kind of balance between the tension and length. When tension and length have a certain range of predictable core response. So it's an integral of the tension length. That's what the whole stretch receptor is about. That's the whole, that's what the whole thing is, is, is working. So my whole point is that you are not introducing the micro ruptures. Because, and that's the, the argument that often you, you, you are hearing from Steve. If you were really introducing the fascia tearing, that would be a huge inflammation, that would be pain, that would be blah, 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 all these unpredictable things. You cannot, you know, let's say the damage would be just too great. But on the other hand, you know, people who say that, they usually invalidate your finding, oh, you know, like you're just kind of, imagining so it's not really changing no it's changing but it's changing in phase two and it's changing not via the external impact but it's changing via this via the internal homeostasis because when we get into the extracellular matrix this is what we have to see there so that's the whole point the internal mechanical homeostasis regulates the stiffness and compliance in the tissue. So basically, and what is the agent of this homeostasis for our kind of narrow point there? That would be the fibroblast, right? So the fibroblast has the capacity to do all four creative impacts. It has the capacity to chop the fibers. It has the capacity to connect, right? It has to, to lay the fibers. It has the capacity to chop their GAGs, right? So their gel component, and it has the capacity to produce the new one. So, you know, that's the thing. For remodeling, you need four creative processes. You have to, you know, and that's necessary and sufficient condition, right? So you see, that's the mathematical speak. If you want to remodel the tissue, you have four necessary and sufficient conditions. So you have to have the tools which are allowing you to chop what has been fixed. So that's one thing, right? So open up and then you need the ones to be create, 
And then, you know, since the tissue has two, two facets, right? So the liquid fascia, the, the fascia gel to so, so and the, the fascia fiber. So you have to do it and do something. So you see, in that sense, what do we have? We end up with the matrix. So where, you know, it's a plus, 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 minus, minus, plus, and the minus, minus, right? So gel release, gel chopping, gel creation, uh, fiber chopping, fiber creation. And well, it's well described. It's well described that depending on the loads and so on, that this is possible, that the internally, the fibroblasts, they have the capacity. So my whole point, do we need to get back here and say, hey, I'm doing the rupture? No, you have to bring yourself into a phase two and say, hey guys, instead of the movement, instead of the material transformation, I am the agent. So, you know, I am outside. It's the hidden layers, it's the internal work of the mechanical homeostasis, which brings the transformation. I am the servant as a body worker. I am the servant. I am the pianist, which plays and tries to invite their internal mechanical homeostasis as the only realistic creative capacity to, and to do that, I do it via the phase two. So that's actually quite simple. And that's what I call the soft heal self healing versus the hard self healing. Hard self healing, you tear it, then it kind of, you know, then it self repairs, but it's, it's a very, very difficult thing to do. And then this is what was the next part of it is that the question is, which is very natural, okay, but if the fibroblast is able to do that, why the hell this stupid fibroblast is not doing it? You know, if it's already able to do it internally, why it's not doing the self repairs? And that's where we move to this next thing. The fibroblast could be either dormant or demotivated. So if the local situation, and that's what you got there from the, all these explanations, of their, uh, you know, Langevin and, and her colleagues, right? So it's about their, you know, the fascia networks, the, the fibroblast networks. So the fibroblasts, right? So are those like star-shaped things. And that's what she was talking to us, right? So you see when she, and the, the picture should be there. So when she talked about the fact that the fibroblast has two states, if it's a, you know, it could be a sleeping beauty state, right? So you see when it literally goes into this kind of globule and kind of falls asleep, and it could be motivated. So if you start pooling this, if you start kind of creating the tension length predictable environment, like basically it's as if it was there, you know, if you take their, the spider web and chop it from the tree, so the spider just sleeps there. So you, and to wake up the spider and make him to start repairing the spider web, you have to create the right measure of tension, but you're not tearing the spider web, you are, have to be there in that very narrow window, which is enough to simulate it, right? So you see to get this tension length ratio. So you don't, if it's too much length, too little tension, that's phase one. If it's too much tension, too little length, that's phase three. So that's where you have this window of phase two. That's your entry into there internal transformation into the stimulation of the mechanical homeostasis. And then, you know, what I found there is there, like it was 2019 work, it was some Chinese guys. So, and I don't know whether it, whether it, whether it was a failure of translation, but they were talking about the motivated fibroblasts. I absolutely love this thing. So basically what you want, you want to get the fibroblasts motivated by creating this controllable, steady tension length environment. And then once we get there, we move to the next phase. So you see, this is what is happened there, right? So you see that in reality, the whole fibroblast network is a coexistence of dormant and motivated fibroblasts. And that is, you know, once you understand that, this is not a surprising thing. So, and then there is a whole field of the paradynamics, which exactly studies those stress strain relationship and which studies the non-local. So it's a non-local elasticity theory, which is an upgrade of the elasticity theory. And what are they telling us? 
you know, this is the text which you can read, but let me just kind of explain it in, in a more simple thing. So the conversation here is about their search as a meta stable states and searching for the next gradient. So the you can read about the gradient descent when it comes to the you know to the modern conversation about the deep learning and so on. So that's the universal method there. So what happens? It's very very simple. Let's give you a simple a, a, a first example to understand what is meta stable. Meta stable is about the like potential versus actualization. So take an example, let's say phases of, of water, not the Pollock phases of water, regular phases of water. So you've got ice, you've got liquid water. Now, typically it transforms there at zero degrees Celsius. So at zero degrees Celsius is their freezing point. But if you do this slowly and so on, you can actually cool the water all the way down to minus four and it would still stay liquid but the moment you have some sort of this some sort of this clusters right so you see if it's already there right it still would be liquid but the moment you get the tiny change it would be like there was a local kind of micro crystallization and boom the whole thing instantly is going to get into ice. The same thing, if you take ice, you can heat it up to plus four and it still would stay ice. But then the moment you've got micro cracks into it appear and some, you know, some liquid, then boom, it's going to melt. So that's really the thing, metastable situations. So in other words, it's not there, you know, it's the, it's the if you think about it as a lattice, Right, so you see the lattice could be that kind of frequency of this frequency, or the lattice could be of that frequency. So meta stable is a transition of the lattice frequency. And that's where we get into very clearly, of course, into Buckminster Fuller and the whole conversation of the tensegrity things there. But that's a very simple thing. So what you what is your entry into the transformation? You have to bring the yourself into their interaction get yourself into that tensional system into the control tension lakes relationship and sort of ignite right so you see trans create the situation where there could be self self click self organization self shift because meta stable situations are characterized by this thing that they're in that sense, it's a potential. It's a it's a it's a potential hole. So, in other words, the the system is looking for its next energy optimization state, but it has to. It needs the external thing to get over the bump, right? So, you see, for example, all these explanations like this. You see, you could be locked in a certain you know let's say current valley but to get into the valley which is more energy efficient you have to go over the bump right it's like you know when you eat food the food so you swallow the food but you need to digest it to extract more energy out of the food that you know that, that it costed you to digest it but you have to get over the energy bump to extract it the same thing here so if you are in that meta stable situation, you need the external stimulus to be able to go over the bump and then go further. And then, you know, as we are already at to approaching and closing the hour. So the conclusion there, this happens at their uniform deformation, meaning when you are holding that, when you are getting into the phase when there is no a real change of length but there is accumulation of tension that would be the uniform deformation so uniform deformation means that it tension changes internal pre-stress changes but the shape doesn't and once you create that that in fact has the capacity to get into this self-organizing cascade of the meta stable situations 
during the gradient descent. And once that happens, that's what you experience as what feels as a release. But in that sense, you are not pulling any fibers. You're not doing anything aggressive and so on. You are effectively bringing yourself into the state of the uniform deformation. And you are actually saying hi to the mechanical homeostasis into this interplay between the stiffness and compliance. And you are relying on the internal creative capacities of the fibroblasts. So in that sense, this is really the key, uniformity. And if you look at the experience of how you do this, well, everything that body work techniques are explaining is about this, right? So you have to approach the person, you know, if the person is in an elevated state and they're super tight and so on, you are unlikely to succeed, right? So you see, you have to cool down the tissues, right? So you see, you cannot just like enter there with the force. So you see, you have to respect the phases, you know, super soft hand versus the super hard hand, following the tissue, listening to the body, reading the response. So all these words, all these poetic images, they're about this, that you are supposed to be in the state of the uniform deformation and then stack the tensional gradients within it. And once you get able to step, stack those tensional gradients, then you would be rewarded with their metastable transformation. So the same way, if you get the, uh, whatever, if your, uh, water is in the minus four degrees. So you just need to ping, a micro move. You know, you're not freezing it. It's already ready to freeze, right? So you, see, you just have to bring it over the border, just bring it over the, over the bump. So the system would start self-organizing and looking for its own energy optimization. So that's really their bigger picture right and in that sense of course i have to bring it back as a completion there to the story how does that all links to bite and segregate so and in that respect this is very straightforward because once again what are we talking about tensegrity and so on it's not about the straight the struts and cables Struts and cables are just the illustration how you can do out of the hard matter. Tensegrity is about behavior. It's about the ability to have this, how far you are you from that equilibrium of death, how far are you from the free body diagram? And what you gain out of this, how this tension things could be stacked that's what about the tensegrity, how you convert behavior wise, how you convert irregular impacts that are coming from all sorts, how you convert them into the maximum uniformity of the deformation, distributing it through the tension and not via the length. Do you see how it plays together? So that's why in summary, the whole thing sounds here. You know, what's the unreasonable effectiveness of the light touch? That's the strain energy, phase boundaries reset. That's the thing. So if the two phases are stuck together, you know, steepness and compliance. So basically by bringing yourself in at the phase two, you are able to bring extra kind of tensional bump without offsetting the lengths and that gives you this transition through the strange strain energy boundaries. And that's where we get back to the integrity, right? Tensional indicates that we focus on the strain energy, right? It's not on the compression, strain energy fields. And integrity highlights that it's a network effect. So in that sense, we talk about the tensegrity as the tensional integrity range. So you optimizing the tensional integrity. So in that sense, this phase two would be their maximum, the maximum tensional integrity range. That would be the maximum tensegrity behavior. So 
I guess I'm already over an hour thing, but I sort of can say that I'm, you know, you know, I don't want to start something else. Otherwise I would overshoot really, 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 really badly. So I believe that, that I great. could be that relatively- great, Bernard, and your timing was perfect. Absolutely. Uh, this is the first time in my life somebody tells me that that I, my, my, my timing was perfect. Tuck, but now- <laughs> Bravo, mm. bravo. Wait, uh, now, wait. I am stuck here. Ah, stop sharing. Okay, all right. <laughs> yeah. My timing was not too bad. Good, all right. Excellent, excellent. We've had lots of comments, excellent comments. Uh, one of those from Gregory Shooty saying, Leonid, you're rocking it. And that went all the way through from the beginning to the end. Um, lots of appreciative comments. Um, one of the most, one of the people who's taught a lot in the chat and left a few questions is Anastasi. Yes, yes. Um, who says, uh, oh, loving the obvious that, sorry? There he is, we can see him. He is. Yes. Yeah, there he is, yeah. he can unmute. Yes. So if everyone can unmute, um, open their videos and Anastasi, the floor is yours to for the moment. Okay, Leonid, you've once again blown my mind. I remember <laughs> meeting you in a hotel lobby or somewhere in New York in early 2000s or the end of 99. And you were placing a lot of towels stacked up on people's bellies. Yeah, so I wondered, <laughs> I wondered after that about what I was doing with my touch. So my question really after seeing your early ABR work and now what you've just presented, I'm, I'm still questioning and wondering about how much pressure, like I'm just, you know, if you're, if you're familiar with the Weber-Fechner principle, we teach that a lot in our Feldenkrais work for reducing uh, pressure, reducing uh, amount of work can exponentially increase sensory feedback. So I'm wondering about the amount of pressure you're talking about here. Okay, so great. But you see, I mean, I love these questions, right? Because you see, this is where we have to evolve, right? We have to evolve. And you know, it's, an, it's a difficult thing, right? Because basically, when we talk about the uniform, uniform deformation, right? So you see, what is our greatest capacity? So first point, I advise everybody to rewatch Myron's video about her kitchen experiment. This is brilliant, brilliant, brilliant way to understand the capacity of this tensional synergy, right? So for those who haven't watched it yet, so you see, I really admire its simplicity because what she's doing, she's taking a simple tensegrity that she, we can't see her, but you know, she's probably doing some kitchen experiment there. What is she doing there, right? She's done a very, like, I mean, it's so brilliant. I mean, it's absolutely blew my mind. So she took their basic tensegrity out of like, whatever, struts and cables not being, being there, well, why, like threads. And she says, look at this. This is a 30 gram thing, ping on the kitchen scale. And then on top of this kitchen thing, which is a 30 gram, she puts one kilo of the flower bag, two kilos of the flower bag. The whole freaking thing doesn't deform. So look at the ratio there. Hey, look can, at can, uh, Maren, you're here. So uh, maybe you can also make sure we put the, uh, Maren's here, Leonid. Yes, and, yes. So she, uh, she puts the link, of course. Yeah, yeah. Put the link to your YouTube videos uh, in the chat, okay? So everybody can see what he's talking about. It's wonderful. Okay, and then, sorry, go ahead. And then only fine. when she puts the third kilo, right? 30 gram thing, 30 gram thing is able to withstand almost three kilos of load. So it's a hundred X gain via this tensional synergy. You see? And that's the whole point of this, that what do we gain by this integration? 
what do we gain? And that was the whole conversation with this Dr. Patrick Johnson, who eventually said, hey, guys, I realize that you are actually saying that the force body diagram doesn't apply. I say, yes. Yes. It's not the problem, you see, and that's my point. It's not the problem of levers any, right? So you see, the, the central battle that Steve was actually having right from the start, it's the battle against the insertion of the force body diagram into humans. And that's why I'm saying, guys, we, have, we should not underestimate Vesalius. So he made a huge move, but there is a huge damage that he has done because he has legitimized. You know, the moment you think of the stack skeleton, it automatically means force bo free body diagram. So that the borders are transparent, that you don't have this kind of cloud, the shield around it. And what Marin's work is showing there brilliantly it's a hundred X gain, hundred times gain via this realization. Because the moment you see what are this, this Patrick Johnson, the question was, you know, guys, I mean, you are, you, you, you are idiots. You are idiots. Look at the fine, like, look at this, uh, you know, we apply the free body diagram to your like three strut integrity. You know, you're morons. You don't understand that putting three sticks together works better in the free body diagram than, you know, like linking them together in the integrity. But that's the whole thing that what is the six strat, oh, sorry, the three strat integrity showing that with a system which is that small, that's a minimal system that could be considered a looped framework. So even just with the three parts, it's already the infinite, infinite, super stable framework. So that's the key thing. And that's why getting back to Anastasia's question, the question is, it's the behavior. It's the behavior. And because of this tensional capacity, because of the tensional capacity, if we respect the uniform deformation at the meta regions, we can stack up to 100 times. Of course, you know, like that's a kind of metaphorical, but even if you can stack it five times, you can stack it 10 times, you can stack it 20 times, this is still massive. So in that sense, and when it happens, you cannot measure forces because the force is a kinetic concept. It implies, the displacement. And that's why the conversation there goes about the force density. It's what you, what you bring as a force density, not as a force magnitude. But the force density, as Mar Maren's thing shows, can be really then stacked. And then you're saying, what? This is the thing which is able, due to the synergy, due to the ability to redistribute in a tensional way, you know, so that self-looped and so on and so forth, that gives you the capacity up to 100 times. So that's, that's really the tricky thing. So that's why, you know, getting back to the stack of towels and so on. So that's where we get to the point. So I was discussing here, the light touches the direct contact. But then, of course, once we understand the uniform deformation, then basically that brings us into the idea of the interfaces. So what? So the interfaces yeah. allow us yes. to change the meta stable, you know, the the, the meta regions. And we, feel, you know, and that's why, of course, when you deal with the CP children, right? So you see, they have some areas of like vast disconnects. So what you are doing there, you are actually bringing the meta component, and then again, you're combining into the uniform deformation. But actually, just to complete it. Where does the theory of the uniform deformation come from? It's the most practical use of it, you know, is in their anti-seismic things. So basically, you know, in Chile and other countries where they, be, you know, the whole theory of their uh, seismic uh, with, withstanding the seismic shocks is 
about creating those units which are able to deliver the uniform information. So even with the big spikes, they are going to redistribute the whole thing. And then, you know, like, so there is no collapse, there is no mm -hmm. buckling and so on. So but that's why we, you know, I'm just bringing it there that we really, you know, my main point is that we are the frontier of science. Yes. Not somebody else. So, you know, we cannot just import simplest explanations from physics and say, hey, you know, okay, we have to listen to what these big guys say. No, you know, we are experiencing the most complex phenomena and we're experiencing the best detection there. Because but, Leonid, but Leonid, isn't it also that it, when you're starting to say how much is too much and what exactly is the touch, isn't it about that what MJ calls the interface. Isn't it about what we do in Tai Chi is a very light touch because it's taking the two systems and allowing them to become one. Which so is- One which, can do a little thing to influence the other. And if you do too much, the other then, one starts defending well, against shutting down. You close the connection rather than keeping it open. Isn't it well, something like that? It is very much like that. And there is a whole science for this, which is called paradynamics. So, go. and then in, in paradynamics, this is, you know, and the paradynamics is the, is the, is the study of the non-local elasticity. That's the upgrade of standard elasticity theory, which includes irregularities and disconnects. So basically there, the definition goes not by the structure, but by behavior, which is identified by the same tensional, let's say, index. They call it the paradynamic horizon, right? Mm -hmm. So you see, basically, if you have two systems, you have to connect them with the uniform, you know, uniform deformation, which will even out the internal tensions between the systems if you even out the internal tensions between the systems then you and the person belong to the same period you know you are impact wise you are having the same paradynamic horizon but they call it the paradynamic family so you become a paradynamic family but because you become a paradynamic family in your target person, right? So you see when temporarily you become one paradynamic family, but because through this, you can stack the tension into their system, which will cause their shifts, internal self-organization shifts in their current metastable situations. So by the time you disconnect yourself, you already initiated their own resets of their own metastable situations and you kind of plugged into this. So even though you temporarily connected into the paradynamic uh, family, then you separate, but the process inside them is, is taking place. Great, thank you. We have some uh, questions here. Yes, from, please. I think Ra Rachel. Got a few issues. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Graham. Um, early on in the presentation, um, Doug Johnson had a question about um, your preferred term. And Doug, do you want to come on and go ahead and ask your own question if, if you still have it? That was actually to somebody in the chat about saying somebody said they didn't like the term body work. So that was a separate discussion, but thanks. I see. <laughs> okay. Okay, moving on then. Next, we had Diane Woodruff. Um, basically in the chat as well, asking about the experience of the receiver. Dan, I don't know if you had something you want to add to that or if that's been covered at this point. I don't, I don't think it's been covered, but um, it, it has, Lenny, what you're saying has a one-sided feel to me that uh, it is, um, it is what you, about what you are doing and what you call what you are doing and all of that all well and good, but this is a this is the interface business. The the 
entrainment between person the, the person giving and the person receiving. And that, that's a big part of that. And we cannot describe that in Newtonian terms. Well, we're not okay. working with in, inert matter. Okay, look, you see, let's put it this way. So my point, right, is that there, let, let's divide it into levels. My first thing is what we have to do is to kind of improve their basic let's say how what we it can extract out of the available sciences right mm -hmm. so you see let's put it like this so yeah, like strange, depending strange. depending on where you are right so you see you could be anywhere from being super reductionist who believes in genes right so you see which are driving the organisms through life right so you see to their super you know let's say super spiritual person who basically sees that everything you know embodied as just the manifestations of the holy trinity right so you see you are somewhere in that stack now the thing is that what we have today you know this stack could be very disrupted like Holy Trinity is on one level, you know, let's say science on the other level, like everything is just disconnected. My point is very simple. You know, of course, we are never going to be able to get a complete representation of the world via the visible things, via the articles. There is always going to right. stay something you know, let's say hidden. And basically we're getting back to the fact that even, you know, talk about the modern science, you know, in the, when the modern science acknowledges the fact that we have, you know, like 4% of the uh, like visualizable matter and 96% of the invisible dark matter, right? So it's in that sense, there is the unknown, there is like this, whatever unseen and so on. So what we are trying to do first is that we are trying to build better in terms of like if today science offers us a certain spectrum of the cognification engines, my first disappointment is saying, hey guys, we are in the field where we can take, where we are dealing with the most complex and the most sensitive system, but we are using the language, the cognification, which is medieval. That's a pity because that completely destroys our experiential thing and doesn't help us. So that's the first point. Second thing is that, which I didn't include in there. So what we actually have to get further. So like, and that's been my focus in the recent months is that actually, if you look at the transitions which are happening now, you know, with so-called artificial intelligence, which is a complete misnomer. So, but if you take it as the deep learning, so there is a growing, you know, what's the, what's the whole realization there? That, you know, everything is fundamentally a black box, meaning that you've got the input, you've got the hidden layers, and then you've got the squeeze functions, and then you've got the outputs. So effectively, it's a recognition that hidden layers are irreducible. So in that sense, what you're saying on the receiving side, they're always going to be internal hidden layers. But what we are just trying to do, as I said, we're having a certain proportion between playing by notes and playing by ear. So today, the entire body work is either playing by ear in your real thing or explanation wise it has nothing to do it's not even playing by notes it's it's playing i don't know it's basically it's not even borrowed notes it's something like i don't know stolen or whatever so my point is this we can improve the notes and if we can improve the notes then the talent and the ability to that can play by ear can gain from there so basically that's the way that we move we take certain experiences, then we recognify them, get them the best understanding to play by notes. And then humans stand on the shoulders of that, right? So you see stand on that from th that, and then you move up. So that's kind of how the whole thing is going. And of course, 
if we get further, so you can be say your, your point about the uh, you know about the the recipient, it's absolutely true. So it's a loop, right? But that's where we we we're talking. If you talk about the uniformity of the response, so we still have to float at the right system level, right? So you see, in that sense, okay, that's a system. In that system, for that particular interaction, we are choosing this cognification. And then this cognification is, you know, what is the only criterion for this cognification? To help us to be more productive in our experiential interactions. So my main message is always the same. You see, guys, you know, your experiential interactions are magnificent. They are amazing. They are incredibly deep. But the language which we import from the other, from the from the physics is, by definition, it's shallow. You know, experiment is eradication of context and it's eradication of the hidden layers. So my point, you know, instead of you can say, I am going to be a magician. That's a, that's a deserving practice. You know, to become a magician is a deserving practice. Then you say everything is hidden layers. Magician tunes in, into the forces of the universe. And that's a, that's a fine way to do it. Hey, right? we have a lot more questions. We have a lot more questions. Yes, yes, please. Rachel, who's next? Next is Fabiana Silva. She had a question about fibroblast timing. Are you able to unmute Fabiana? There she. Yeah. Hello, guys. Hello. hello. I want to know if you. Hello. Um, I want to ask you if you know uh, normally how fast the fibroblast responds to our sorry Fabiana we cut out work it at the fiber fiber level right okay you, but you I understand that? your question sorry? okay but I mean it's it was clear you know what is the delay there right so you see this is a you see this is a super important question super important question because basically what if we start if we if we step back what is the whole problem of the muscular perspective? Muscles have huge delays. You know, the fastest arcs give us, let's say, 100 milliseconds. Okay, I'm generous, 50 milliseconds, doesn't matter. So what happens, there is a huge... So if you think about a system which is integrated into the world and has this milliseconds, so then... Well, you are kind of, you are exposed. There's a huge doorway. Now, what, if you get back to the, to the whole thing of what is instant, that's really the, the whole point. How do you define instant? And this is where we get into the important mathematical points. So you see, there are two ways to answer this question. One, one way to answer this question would be uh, simpler. If we look at the things which uh, Sue and Graham were presenting, I don't know, it was like at the, in, the, in the very early tea parties, about the famous mantis shrimp. So the mantis shrimp, which is able to act within three milliseconds delay. I mean, three milliseconds delay. So now my point is again reversing the argument and saying, hey, if the biological tissues are able to have this example of the fastest possible action, so by right, you see, to do action, you need the reservoir and the pool of the counter action of the reaction which is going to allow you to get the you know you see to get selective you need to have the whole thing so that means that in that respect we get back to the fundamentals of mathematics right so what is the central theorem of calculus 
derivative and antiderivative, right? So, so for any derivative, there has to be antiderivative. So in that sense, it's not, a, and when we talk about the delay in terms of time, we focus exclusively on the kinetic point, how fast. And I'll tell you the truth, I've been stuck with this question for many years. You know, you know I had the same disconnects. I couldn't link those things together because there was a natural question. Okay, guys, you know, like, you know, if we are, dealing with a system that has to react with 100 milliseconds delay and you are not able to produce so then by right your action has to be super fast not super slow you know if you keep thinking this way right so you see how you can control something super fast by being super slow doesn't make sense so the only way to get out of this dilemma is to understand what's behind what is fast what is the whole idea of fast? The idea of fast that you've got position, displacement, displacement per time, the second derivative, displacement of the displacement per time, that's their acceleration. But if you look further, you understand that this is a stack of derivatives, right? So you see first, second, third, fourth, and so on, all the derivatives. So the only way to deal with them is not by the timing, but by building the antiderivatives which are able to convert any action, however fast is it, into the uniform deformation, means into the ultimate spread, which makes it instant. So that's the whole trick of the tensegrity perspective, that, you know, that it has this capacity, you know, which is effectively, what is it if you put it into the other terms, you know, what is a free body diagram? What is the Vesalius stack of bones? That's their equilibrium biomechanics. So now, what are we looking at? What is life? Life is as far from equilibrium as you can possibly get. You are farthest from equilibrium. And biotensegrity is about the representation of that state of being the farthest possible from equilibrium. And in that sense, that's what I call the anti-mechanics. So mechanics is about death. It's about and death in the practical sense, return to equilibrium. So anti-derivatives. So that's why basically the entire body is about the anti-derivatives, how you can counteract, how you can deal with this external mechanics. And again, that's why I love Marin's example, which sort of strikes it in your head. Look, what is going to give you this 100x ratio of their conversion of external things into this internal uniform deformation. And that's why, of course, you know, if you shoot the bullet, you know, what does it do, right? So the bullet basically is kinetic thing. So it, it, it comes over, it, it gets through. So there's no, thing. it's basically, it is getting over the shield of being far from equilibrium and brings you back to equilibrium. So that's right. a set. Thank you, Lenny. So, can, yes. can we move to some more questions? Yes, please. Rachel. Yeah, our next question was from Mariana about stress transfer. Mariana? Mm. Yes. What was the question, Mariana? Mariana. Okay, because um, Anastasia asked about what's the minimum pressure. And you, you correct me once or twice or a million times that it wasn't yes. pressure, it wasn't push, it was yeah. stress transfer. So maybe it's a... Well, I mean, okay, so that's, that, you see, that's, you know, that's, a, that's an older version, right? So you see, in that sense, you kind of, that was pre-paradynamics. I didn't discover paradynamics then. So in that sense, this is, you know, because you, you're trying to get, so the, the whole language of stress was there that to highlight the fact that there's a force per area, right? So as opposed to force. So. And in that's, but the key question is there, right? It's the, you see, 
that's the tricky thing that we are basically we are at the interface right and that that's where we are at that simultaneous so basically external converts into the internal that's a stress train stress strain transfer to be technical right so you see basically external stresses convert into the internal strains right so which in that sense which are then also the strains ideal strain is not the one that changes the length but the one that just converts into the tension so if you look at the tension length integral the length part is the one that you you fix but the tension because it's a tension network your tension can grow at a huge multiple so and once again that's Marin's example right so you see that's a vivid example of how you know for the same length means that you you know you are not changing lengths you're not changing displacements you are uniform there right so you see then the whole thing can really store huge amounts of tension so and in that respect this is the that's the transfer that we are looking at so how you know it's not about how much or whatever it's about the transition from of phases phase 1 that's the waviness and the creep that means that the length which is less than tension. So you can change length without changing the gradient of tension. And then the phase two, this is where you get into the length, which becomes fixed. And then there is a gradient of tension. Phase three, length increases. So bang, you've got the kinetic problems. Great. So what word, what word are you using now? If you are, if like how, to make to bring this to earth and to answer Anastasia's uh, question, what is that that we're doing with our hands? How do you describe that? Like, what's the word? No, don't give me the whole. What word are you? Are you talking about interface? Are you talking about contact? Are you talking about? Well, you see, that's why at the current stage, right? So you see, I prefer to move it more into the computer science conversation. But that's, that's where, we you know, when we get at the deep learning and so on, when we get into the hidden layers, that's why we get a much better representation. But, if you're, but because you're trying to keep me in the structural terms, that's where I feel more constrained. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, I would say that, look, we cannot reduce it. You see, that's the same thing. We have to accept the fact that this is going to be a matrix of the representation. It's going to be interface, contact, transition, and so on. So basically, you are in the interface, and that interface spreads, right? So you see, that's where you, like, and not a single world, because they are exported from the more, like, from the smaller interactions. It's not going to be enough to mm -hmm. capture this at once. So it, it should be that... Leonid, but maybe it's like you were talking about how it becomes a family. Maybe yeah, it's that's like why, yeah, family. Well, that, that's right. Like so that's why. Influence. Absolutely. That's why. Influence that's why. In the family. Yes, Susan, thank you very much. So that's why I prefer the paradynamic conversation of getting, creating, creating their paradynamic horizon and unifying the regions into a paradynamic family. I have to listen to this again, like five times. <laughs> Next, we have a question from Elizabeth Larkham. Elizabeth, can you unmute yourself? Um, yes, I, I believe that I have. Is that accurate? Yes, it yes, is. yes. Leonid, such a pleasure to, uh, to hear you. Um, Thank you. I have, um, I hope what will be a peridynamic um, interaction with a client in nine minutes. Um, <laughs> I, I put in um, two questions in the chat. Uh, one, um, have you references to recommend uh, regarding peridynamics? I, I put it in the chat, the guy who, who created the field. Thank you. Good. Well, although, then, you know, let's say it's, I must tell you, mm, well, start with the website, but then it's not, it's not easy. You see, it's like these people, they have a lot of presentations, but they have 
presentations, I actually found two videos from him, which helped me because you see like they're using the terms there and you know using this, the, 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 the notation, which uh, the problem is that there are not enough letters in the, in, in the alphabet, right? So you see, depending on the field, you get different things. But Thank my you, point, yeah. but there, there, yeah. there are some people, there are some people on YouTube that you can, that you can listen that can really help with that. Can, can we put that, we'll put that link in next week's newsletter. And I know I would love to hear you ask this second question, Elizabeth. Yes, please. Before you go. The paradynamic interaction is getting nearer, yes. Yes, um, Leonid, would you recommend action steps individual manual practitioners and movement educators can take now in order to contribute to the efficacy of our communication? Well, that's a good question, I must think about it but uh, in my first place so you see i'm uh, like well first thing is that i'm always welcoming the responses right so you see the more questions and the more responses are there in terms of what is understandable and what is kind of clicking in that sense because you see the things which are clicking for me in terms of creating this inner hidden state of understanding are not necessarily the things which are clicking for the others because that dramatically depends on the experiences and so on and the more one can sort of articulate that and say well i mean i feel i get it or whatever you know like or is it like that so the more of those i would hear the better and the second and the second question is actually the second point is is is, is very practical in that sense so you know, my message would be always the same. Say, guys, you know, once you understand that your power, your magic is in the transitions between the phase one and phase two. So instead of trying to rush towards the phase three, where you feel that those kind of releases are happening, give yourself more time in exploring your entry zero to one one to two observe what is happening there and that is going to be you know I, i'm i'm confident that you're going to find lots of the unexplored and the very surprising positive responses there great do we have any more questions rachel we do carol davis had put in the chat that she had a question well, actually, Elizabeth just asked it for me and it was answered beautifully. Thank you. Perfect. Then that's it. Thank you, okay. Greg. Well, All before right. we, uh, what I must do is uh, follow along from all the comments in the chat, which is to thank you enormously for your presentation, which is uh, so much appreciated from what I can see. Um, and before we uh, inform you what's going on for next week, I think. We'll, well, but uh, let me just let me just say yeah. thanks to Graham himself, right? Because basically, if we get back to the chapter, it was if it wasn't, you know, I was forced to be squeezed into what was like five thousand words, and I started, you know, I was on the way to twenty thousand. There was no way to do that. So, and it was Graham's skillful and at the same time very delicate interaction that really uh, helped to kind of sharpen the whole thing and distill it and so on so i'm extremely grateful because that really very much it's been a huge help and uh, you know graham i just wanted to say this publicly how much i appreciated it at the time and continue to appreciate it going on well thank you it was a lot of fun doing it so i'll uh, transfer to chris can you do the sponsors if you will Yes, thank you, Graham. And thank you, Leonid. I'm so happy to hear all of this. Like many others, I will need to listen again multiple times. Every time I hear you speak, there's something new that explodes in here. So for our sponsors, our Biotensegra Tea Party is an all-volunteer production of the Stephen M. Levin Biotensegrity Archive. And it's made possible through the generous support of our sponsors. Leonid's chapter is from this book, which is published by Handspring Publishing, one of our sponsors. If you are here on Zoom, Gregory is gonna put the coupon code and the link for Handspring in general into the chat. 
this is an amazing book and I know you'll enjoy it. Uh, Handspring also has regular newsletter and an ongoing webinar series with Elizabeth Larkham, who we just heard from. We're also sponsored by Embodied Biotensegrity, which is the online learning platform that I run. And I'm just gonna give a little plug because if you've enjoyed this discussion, if you wanna go back and watch this tea party on April 7th, I think it is, Leonid is going to be attending the Biotensegrity Book Club for a small group discussion. And we've got a free two week trial for the membership right now. Artifact Pro, I know Fernando's was watching on YouTube. Hi, Fernando. And he makes incredible Tensegrity models. He also has a coupon that will be put into the chat. Integrated Biotensegrity in Canada, Lisa, Rachel, Paul Thornley had an amazing weekend. The replays are still available for purchase until Sunday. And once purchased, you'll have a month to enjoy them. And finally, the Biotensegrity Congress will be running a series of workshops. So we have one weekend, three days, a Friday to a Sunday, that will be April 23rd to 25th. And it will be available in Portuguese, English, and I think I saw on the website Spanish, not 100% sure. Susan's nodding. They are offering a 15% discount with the coupon code BioWorld, which I think I'm allowed to say. And but, uh, Chris, Anna's here. Anna, did you want to say anything about it? Hi, everyone. It's going to be held in Portuguese and English. Ah, OK, thank you. Thank you, thank you okay. Anna. And for all the hard work you've had, you're putting into this, where I know we're going to enjoy that. So that is it for sponsors, Graham, next week. Yes, next week. Um, well, the tea parties have been going for about a year now, almost a year, and lots of people have heard about biotensegrity, the word spreading. So next week, we're going to have a, a few speakers who are members of the Biotensegrity Archive Board. That's Chris Clancy, Susan Lowell de Solorsano, Doug Johnson, and myself, and perhaps others as well. Leonid. Leonid coming? Leonid, of course. Sorry, Leonid. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And will be. Um, he, he was just yeah. having too much of me for today, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be looking at definitions of tensegrity, biotensegrity, and applied biotensegrity because they're all interrelated, but there's so many different ideas about what each one of these things is. So we're going to introduce some ideas and discuss it and um, take it away from there. So next week, definitely a watch. So I'm going to now finalize to uh, by turning over to Leonid to present the final toast. Okay, so okay, so I guess for you know for their getting furthest and furthest away from the equilibrium for all of you guys keeping for as far as from equilibrium as possible for as long as possible and particularly the man in a in a funny hat. So. <laughs> cheers. Cheers. Hello, cheers. Gumbay. <laughs>